Uh, we are live. Uh, we have folks, uh, a lot of folks in already. Um, hey, everybody. Again, use that chat. Let us know where you're clicking in from. And uh, when you do, make sure you choose all panelists and attendees and you can share um, what's going on in your world with uh, uh, lots and lots of other people from around the food system, whether you uh, manufacturers, distributors, uh, chain restaurants, you know, uh, you know, retailers, um, everybody in that value chain. And uh, we really do want to continue this uh, great community that we have here. Uh, I'm joined today by Marie Moldy uh, and also Dr. Paul Rosin, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, he's going to give a really interesting talk today, uh, and I'm going to basically learn as we go. So I'll be one of you, um, essentially. And uh, before we get there, we did have a couple of obligatory pieces of content. Um, one is that there's always new reports about the status of COVID and the food industry and in particular food service uh, that we're posting regularly. There's uh, brand new content there for you as well at datacentral.com slash coronavirus. And as always, this has been made uh, completely free of charge to the industry so we could continue recovering as quickly as humanly possible. Um, so with that, there are two main stats that uh, we like to track and, uh, and we've been asked a lot about Here's the latest on that. I'm going to just spend literally just a few seconds. So the question about whether people are very concerned about coronavirus, we're sort of in that stable state, um, holding at about 53% versus late September. That's sort of what we predicted last time, that unless something really dramatic happens, we're probably sort of in a semi-stable region for now. So I think a lot of this is going to be driven by uh, news and what the media uh, ends up covering or other events that just happen in the world. But for now, I'd imagine we'll stay in that 50% range, uh, certainly below the, the high peak that we hit in early April and certainly a decline from that secondary peak we achieved a couple of months ago. Um, but uh, I would expect us to be in that 50% 50, 50 range for a little while until something happens in the world. Similarly, uh, we're seeing actually uh, even better results on this notion of are you definitely avoiding eating out? We hit a big peak again in that first, second week of April it has dropped, it had a secondary but lower peak in uh, the middle of July, and it has since uh, continued to decline and we're sitting at about 40% right now. And to put that in perspective, that is uh, the best number we've had, basically tied with a low that we saw in June. And it's the best number we've had since before COVID really became a major thing in every single person's life in this country. So um, that looks like good news and people are uh, really more open today uh, than they were before going out to restaurants, but we still got some ways to go. So with that, I'm going to basically turn most of this over to uh, Dr. Paul Rosen. Uh, if you were on um, before we officially started just now, you heard me refer to him as the most interesting person in food. Uh, I know you say that's an opinion, Dr. Rosen, but to me, it really is sort of like a fact because it is endlessly entertaining and interesting to listen to you. Uh, so uh, you're in for a treat, and um, the topic today is the psychology of meat. Uh, Dr. Paul Rosen is the preeminent person in the world about the psychology of food, uh, and I could go on and on, but I think if you just start um, listening to some of the things he has to say now, uh, you will get that sense very, very quickly. So Paul, uh, I am your clicker, so tell me anytime you want me to click next, and uh, Okay, well, you got the right one to start. So I'm starting. Hello, everybody. I, I love food. I love restaurants. I ate out last night on, a, on the street uh, in an Indian restaurant. Uh, a, they've been closing streets in Philadelphia and letting restaurants spill out into the streets. So it was very pleasant with, a little, with some heat lamps and working it out. So I want to start with scripture and the very beginning of the Old Testament. Genesis 1, 29, God to said to Adam, uh, basically to Adam and Eve, God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you, it shall be meat. Now, the word meat, of course, is a translated word. That's in the translation of the Old Testament. I'm not sure how that happened. But my point is to point out to you that, in case you have never thought of this, Adam and Eve were vegans. And in fact, humans did not eat meat 
until after the flood when uh, God told Noah that, all right, I give up, eat meat. Uh, that, that is to say, it was a concession to the, uh, to the fragility of humans, to their uh, inability to control themselves, and meat is, after all, extraordinarily appealing. So next. A so, slide. so we're going to start with the patrol, a poll, and I want to ask you, do you think of fish as a kind of meat? The answer is yes or no. Uh, so uh, we have lots of votes coming in very, very quickly. We'll give this one another 15 seconds, and we're way okay, past a statistically relevant sample. Paul, I'm guessing you know what the ratio is probably going to look like uh, for the U.S., but keep in mind, we have exclusively food professionals that are voting in this, so this poll. This is not a, a, a random sample of anything, but I just want to get your sense of this, of course, just to illustrate a point I want to make. Right. So I'm going to end polling now. Paul, do you want to venture a guess as to what the, the numbers look no, like? No, because I've never, have, I've never dealt with this with food professionals. All right, so have, your guess is as good as mine. Here we go. 69% hmm. okay, say so yes. Six, 69, you can save this, right, Jack? So I can yes, look at yeah. it. I'll share this with you 69%, later. 69% yes, 31% no. So most of you think fish is meat. Now what's interesting about this next slide is that, um, uh, well that should be uh, animated, uh, but maybe you can't. All right, well don't worry about it. Um, just to mention, isn't it odd that meat, such a basic word about such a basic thing in our life, is there's not an agreement about what it is. So if you say to someone, I don't eat meat, they don't know what you mean. You know, if you say, you say I don't eat vegetables, they know what you mean. But meat is, a, it's a, a, astonishing. And by the way, this is not just true about English. I've done this with some other languages too, and people don't agree about what meat is. Now, um, in, in Spanish, for example, you use the word meat to describe particular things. So you'd say carne de res, meat of, meat of cow, but we don't do that in English. Okay, so meat is a favorite human food. It is one of the most nutritious, if not the most nutritious food. It's central to human evolution. Tools, fire, cooking, hunting, all about meat and domestication. One of the two major components of domestication is the domestication of animals for meat and dairy. So there's a lot of wonderful stuff about me, but it's also the most tabooed food in the world, by far, cross-culturally, nothing close. And there are about 500 million, that's a very rough estimate, vegetarians in the world. There are no meatitarians to speak of. There are people who are sort of carnivores. So why is, why is this favorite food, this highly nutritious food, so important in making us the humans we are the most tabooed, and why there's so many people who don't eat it. So what's going on, and that's why I think meat is interesting, because it has positives and negatives. Next slide. Just for a record, the two of the major orders of mammals, carnivora and insectivora, are named for their food habits. The whole group. Um, you have to hunt, and, and, and uh, hunting prey is uh, extraordinarily challenging. And many of the adaptations of humans to the world, I mean, if you want to know, you know why, how come we can pitch and hit balls in baseball and all that, that probably partly comes from this challenge we have to meet. So I just want to point out how important meat is in our history, our prehistory before domestication. Next slide. So here's a question I'm gonna, I've asked people. Assume that you are alone on a desert island for one year and you can have water and one other food. Pick the food that you think would be best for your health. Never mind what food you would like. Select the food you would pick from the list below. And there's the list. Corn, alfalfa sprouts, hot dogs, spinach, peaches, banana. Are we having a poll on this? We do. Yes. <laughs> so I'd like you to pick the food that you would survive best on for a year on an island with water. It's actually a lot of fun to watch these numbers come in in real time. I, I don't see that. Uh, I, I have uh, God mode privileges, so I can actually God see this mode happening. is, you know, 
But you're a CEO, right? I mean, you get God mode. Something like that. But I, I can see yes, all, the, I all the things coming in, which is uh, very entertaining. And yeah. um, most people have voted at this point. So okay, I'm going to give everyone five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. End polling. Paul, do you want to venture any guesses as to what came up number one? Uh, well, from the date I have bananas. Look at that. Wow. But you're food professionals, so that you're may right. not be true. It, okay. Yeah. All right. I could not imagine so, a diet of spinach and water. That that seems. Well, okay. we're talking about nutrition, basically, right? Staying alive. Yeah. So, bananas are first, spinach are second, and the next slide I'll show you our results from this question, which I find very striking. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, we have college students, a national sample, and we have a bunch of nutrition faculty. They were actually not nutrition. I gave a lecture to the nutrition department, and this was the audience I asked this question. What you'll see is that banana wins, that's the 41 and 44, but not among the nutrition faculty, for which hot dogs wins. Now, the interesting thing here is that people, Meat has a sort of a bad aura for health now in our country. That is to say, it's considered one of the high fat foods and so on. And people think that it might be unhealthy to eat a lot of meat. And they confound that with the fact that what's a good complete food? Because meat is one of the few complete foods. Maybe milk chocolate you could live on. And that was the second choice of the uh, food of the nutrition people. I would have said it was hot dogs. Uh, I'm not sure you could live on hot dogs alone for a year, but you'd have a shot at it. Uh, you certainly wouldn't for any of those vegetables up at the top or fruits. Not a chance. You wouldn't get the, an adequate protein. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Meat is a complete food and it's biochemically like humans because animals are very similar to humans. So their flesh is like our flesh. Their nutritional needs are like our nutritional needs. But for the same reason that animals are chemically like humans, they're also the, the, the source of the pathogen, most of the pathogens that are, attack humans because those pathogens can live in animals and they can live in humans. Most of them can't live in bananas, okay? So the, the plus is it goes with them. So this is my standard slide, which some of you may have seen in a previous lecture I gave. But this is my view of the mouth side view of eating. That is, you, from your mouth looking out, food is coming in. That happens to be a piece of cucumber. And the question is, should I put that in my mouth? Big issue. And one of the reasons that it's a big issue, of course, it could be toxic. It could be beneficial. It tastes good, it tastes bad. Uh, but in addition to that, there are psychological aspects of eating. And one of them on the next slide is the principle of you are what you eat. A widely held view in traditional cultures that you take on the properties of what you eat. And we did a study to show this in American college students, sophisticated people. They read about a particular culture we made up. The Chandorans are the native inhabitants of the Chandor Islands. We give them a bunch of information about the Chandorans. And the particular critical part is we say diet and habits. The Chandorans are primarily hunters and fishers. Half the people who read that then read wild boar and various kinds of fish constitute their main foods. In addition, they hunt marine turtles for its shell but do not eat it. So they wild boar eaters, turtle hunters. The other half, they don't know this as a special part. They just read this whole thing. It's not highlighted like this. The other half is marine turtle and various kinds of fish constitute their main foods. In addition, they hunt wild boar for its tusks, but do not eat it. So both groups hunt boar and turtle, but only one group, one group, it's only turtle, the other group only boar. And then we ask them, what do you think about these people? You know, now that you've read a couple of paragraphs and we put in the questions, uh, they had to rate how much they were this way, this way or that way, and we put in there some boar characteristics and some turtle characteristics. Next slide. So we find that the boar eaters are more loud and outspoken versus the 
turtle eaters, which are more quiet and shy. The boar eaters are more good runners, but the turtle eaters are more good swimmers. And the boar eaters are more likely to be bearded, and the turtle eaters have no facial hair. So you see that without, these are people who don't think that you actually, when you eat boar, become bearded. They don't have that view. They understand that when you eat something, it gets broken down into its basic elements, and you don't, you know, you couldn't tell whether your glycine was from a pig or from a, from a turtle, right, in your gut. But, these, but, it, but at some deep level, they believe that there's some way that the property of what you eat is, is, is uh, transmitted to who you are. And we'll get back to this when we think that we get to the idea that people who eat meat are more animal-like in some way, okay? So I think this is one of the ideas that people have these deep, unacknowledged views. In traditional culture, people acknowledge this. I'll say, oh yeah, you, this should become like that. Okay, next slide. Now let's look at, I think meat is a prototype of ambivalence. It has positives. It is, if, it may be the favorite food of humans. I guess chocolate, well, around the world, it wouldn't be a problem because much of the world doesn't like chocolate, but that's just because they haven't had a chance to eat good chocolate yet. Um, so it's a favorite food, it's nutritionally complete, it has a very appealing texture and taste. And it's a favorable, I'm calling it a metaphor, meaning metaphor. So you say, I'll get to the meat of the paper. And that means the good part of the paper, right? So meat is used in that way positively. Now we get to the negatives. It's the most tabooed food cross-culturally. It's costly. It's hard to obtain and produce. In American culture, it is believed that a high meat diet is unhealthy over the long run. Now, incidentally, people don't realize that a low meat diet is perfectly fine, even by those standards. Uh, it involves mistreating and killing animals, and it is now bad for a new aim of culture sustainability because it's relatively costly to the environment. So you have all these positives, all these negatives. Next. And it has its own basic emotion. Now, there's, a, there's another emotion of pleasure, of course, which is very much associated with eating meat. But that's not unique to meat. We use pleasure in general. But we have an emotion called disgust, which is originally about food. The emotion originated as food. The word disgust means bad taste. It centers on meat. Almost all disgusting foods are of animal origin. It's amazing. This is almost entirely true. So if somebody says, Asparagus is disgusting to me. It's rare that they would say that. But if, if you do a quick test, if you touch asparagus to a favorite food, will you eat the favorite food? And the answer is yes. But if you touch anything disgusting to a favorite food, say a cockroach or, or, or kind of meat that you think is disgusting, then they won't, people won't eat it. So you very rarely find something that isn't meat that it has the power to contaminate another food. And of course, there are people who believe that disgust originated, it's not certain, as a, a motion to keep us away from pathogens. And since meat is the principal source of food pathogens, they think that's why uh, meat has been so uh, tied to disgust. That's not certain. Next slide. Just to show you, these are the markets. And this is a market in Sri Lanka. These people are obviously not worried about reminding you that the meat that they're selling comes from an animal, right? Very clear. Next slide. This is a, a Pennsylvania Dutch butcher uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And you can see that there, they have all sorts of food that many Americans would find disgusting, like uh, smoked pig feet, and there's rabbit over there at the top, labeled, but it's not hitting you in the face the way it does in the Sri Lankan market. And next slide, this is a typical American supermarket. You wouldn't know those were animals. We disguise animals when we sell them. We, we break the link between an animal and the food we're reading that we call meat. And uh, I think a little kid of four years old going through the market wouldn't know, I've never done this, that those things are actually pieces of animals. And we do that for a reason because people don't feel comfortable eating animals, but they love meat. Okay, next slide. 
this is a, a graph I made up. This is not real data. And this has to do with delicious to disgusting scale, right? Zero is disgusting, 100 is delicious. And look, we're looking at different animals there. So for Americans, cows, pigs, lamb there, well, lamb not always, but cows and pigs are very delicious. Whereas goats, giraffes, uh, all kinds of things, including wolf and the bats are really disgusting. So if you think about it, most animal food is disgusting to Americans and to many people in the world, though. For example, in China, they eat a much wider range. But we love a very small segment of the animal world to eat. They're among the, our very favorite foods, but most of the rest of it is, is not of interest. In fact, it's off-putting. Next slide. If we look at the consumed animal species, there are about 4,000 mammals in the world. Americans eat three of them. Now, again, we're low on that compared to other countries, but the point is, it's an enormous amount. Most, of, I think the most common uh, mammals in both number species and numbers are rodents and bats, and we are just totally disgusted by them. Next slide. Now we're looking at, no, that back one. Uh, this is all animal species. A percent of all animal species that we eat, well, it's virtually zero. I mean, there are a million species of insects. We don't eat any of them. 4,000 species of mammals, we hardly eat any of them. So we're just, what's so fascinating about it is not only that we love meat, but we really strongly dislike most things that you would call meat, like pieces of camel flesh and so on. So it's, it's a peculiar thing. It, it, the really interesting question, if you look at this, is why do we eat any meat? Because we don't like practically any of the alternative meats we have in the world, but we love this small subset. Uh, next slide. And now we look at, here's just an example illustrating that. Let's go to the next slide. And here we do, what parts of animals do we eat in the United States? We eat muscle, we eat milk and eggs. We don't eat cartilage, we don't eat bones, skill, nails, hair, eyes, kidneys, stomach, liver. We don't eat blood, we don't eat brain and heart. Now some small percentage of Americans do, and many more French and even many, many more Chinese do. But look at this peculiar thing. Of all this animal food that we could eat, all nutritious, all probably would taste good if you didn't know what it was. So my guess is if you ate bat meat, but didn't know it was bad, you might like it. As soon as you heard it was bad, you say, oh, terrible. So this is a very peculiar thing. So there's a very delicate line between what we love, like uh, even say cow, and what we dislike strongly in America, even goat. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about some work on meat. This was done with uh, Matthew Ruby, who's now a faculty member in Australia, and four others students, notice one's a vegan, one's a vegetarian, one's a, a really big meat eater, and one is a former vegetarian. Okay, let's look at the world picture now. So here is annual meat consumption, kilograms per capita for a bunch of countries. The top line, the blue line, is for the United States. We're way up there. And you notice our meat intake has been slowly climbing as we become wealthier. Meat, uh, uh, percent of meat in the diet is very much related to wealth. And it's uh, slightly declining there. I don't have the more recent data. My guess is it's declined a little. The second curve, the greenish blue one, is Brazil, a very large country and going up. The red curve is China, 1.4 billion people. And the yellow one that's on the bottom and almost at zero is India. So if you're looking at the future of meat, just in terms of the demographics, you're gonna say more meat is gonna be eaten because Americans are only five, less than 5% of the world. And the, and, the, and the developed world, which are the big meat eaters, Western Europe, most of other parts of Europe, Australia, Japan, a few others, they're only about 20 to 25% of the world. So the developing world is a low meat as it's relatively little meat because they're not wealthy. And they treasure meat and that's gonna go up. Yeah, next. 
Caller, our audience is kind of speculating what kind of meat eater you are. I think you identify as flexitarian, right? You yes, eat meat. but I will actually discuss my situation directly later. Okay. Um, yeah. um, so this is a survey that was done by Oxfam, Oxford University. Um, and they asked about a thousand people in different parts of the world, what's your favorite food? That's all they asked them. What's your favorite food? And here's the results from Russia. And number one is meat. The red squares mean it's a meat product. Number one was meat, number six was chicken, and number 13 was kebab. So they're right up there, big meat eating country. There's a lot of countries in this survey. I'm just gonna show you a few. And of course they say, uh, okay, the second one is USA. Number one is pizza, by the way. By far, you'll notice 15%. Pizza is the favorite food of the United States, without any question. But steak is two, chicken is three, burger is eight, beef is 15, uh, and I don't see sushi. They, yeah, sushi is 10. I didn't mark it, because that's, again, a question of whether you call sushi meat. But anyway, sushi is even 10. So we're big meat in here. Now we go to India, which is 1.3 billion people. And the only food of the top 15 that gets meat is chicken. That's seven. And by the way, pizza even in India is eight, you'll notice. So this is a very interesting, they did this with about 15 countries. It's very interesting, let me see. Okay, next. It slide. is actually interesting, Paul. I don't know if this was just the way the survey was constructed, but um, in India, people say their favorite food is Indian food. Do they really think of Indian food as just being one distinct thing like that? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, why does somebody say Indian? That was true of the Mexicans too. Their favorite food was Mexican. So some people have a very distinct idea of their country's food. Now, India is very varied, as is Mexico by region, but there's a sense of Indian food, and they really mean their local food, mm. local Indian food. But no one would say American right. in the United States because we don't really know what that means. What is American food? Pizza is apparently the favorite dish. So now let's talk about attitudes to meat by a number of important figures in history, all inclining to not eating it, okay? So Buddha says the eating of meat extinguishes the seed of great compassion. Notice the idea is that the eating itself, the, the destroying of animal life indirectly is, uh, it harms your personality. Go ahead, your card. next slide. Pythagoras says, animals share with us the privilege of having a soul. For as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. So this is a you are what you eat sort of thing. And the idea is that, do you think that animals have souls? I think most people who eat meat don't think animals have souls because you're not destroying a soul then by eating meat. Okay, go ahead. Leonardo da Vinci, if man wants freedom, why keep birds and animals in cages? Truly man is the king of beasts, for his brutality exceeds them. We live by the death of others. We are burial places. I have since an early age abjured the use of meat. Now it's interesting that we don't have a lot of quotes to the opposite about how wonderful meat is because people who love meat don't feel it's necessary to say that <laughs> because everyone around them loves meat. These are exceptional people who are arguing against the thrust of their culture, to eat a lot of meat and to value. Albert Einstein, I have always eaten animal flesh with a somewhat guilty conscience. Nothing will benefit human health and increase chances of survival of life on earth as the evolution of a vegetarian diet. Next, Adolf Hitler, this is the big surprise, but there's nothing I can predict there's one thing I can predict to eaters of meat. The world of the future will be vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian, and they must spare me from their meat. Hitler was not only a vegetarian, he was what we call a moral vegetarian. He thought it was immoral to kill animals and eat their meat. He didn't, of course, eat Jews, but he didn't think it was immoral to kill Jews and gypsies. But he did think it was immoral to kill animals. Next slide. Mohandas Gandhi, I do feel that spiritual progress does demand at some stage that we should cease to kill our fellow creatures for the satisfaction of our bodily wants. 
He, of course, is Hindu, and roughly half the vegetarians in the world are Hindus. Next slide. Venus Williams. She's a vegan because she knows how important a role a diet plays. So she's what we would call a health vegetarian, a vegan. It's not a moral thing for her. It's that her body will be better if she doesn't eat meat. Next slide. So there's an omnivore vegan continuum. We start with omnivore up there. We have what we'll call a conflicted omnivore. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. A reducitarian, also called a flexitarian, partial vegetarian, vegetarian, and vegan. So there's all these degrees of, of your relationship to meat. We could put up at the top carnivore, which would mean someone who eats almost only meat. And there are people like that, among others, the Inuits uh, in, uh, in Alaska and Canada. Next slide. So I want you to I want to ask you this question on the poll. I feel bad about eating meat. Yes or no? I'm seeing those numbers coming. I don't want to bias anything, so I'm gonna not comment on it's the trends like, that I'm like seeing. Giving the election results from the East Coast, right? When yeah. the West Coast is still voting. <laughs> it's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, we should okay. not do that, by the way. Everyone, any sensible person would say that we shouldn't give the East Coast Coast results to the West Coast as well. Yeah. Looks like uh, we have a lot of votes. I'm gonna end polling right now. And 24% yes, 76% no. Okay, so this is, this is, this is about what I expected uh, in a non-food uh, professional context. So there is, there is a sense, a large sense, most of these people who said yes, eat meat. They just feel bad about it. Okay, so we have a scale called the conflicted omnivore scale, and here are the items. You get a score of agree or disagree. I feel bad about eating meat, you just said one. I think that eating meat is ethically acceptable. Uh, that's a, re that's a, a reverse scored item. That is to say, you know, it's the opposite of the first one. I am okay with how animals raised for food are killed. That's a reversed item. I am okay with how animals raised for food are treated, reversed. I am concerned about the effects of meat production on the environment. I am concerned about the effect of meat consumption on my health. You get a score, okay? The, the, when you agree with the, the uh, counter meat view, you get a score of is one to three, depending how strong you agree. We add those numbers up. If you get a score more than zero, we're calling you a conflicted omnivore. That is to say you're eating, you're eating meat, or you may or may not be eating meat, but you feel there's something wrong with eating meat. That we all kinds of we all do things that we think are not optimal. I mean, people often do things that they would say I shouldn't do them. I bet you do a few every day. Okay, next slide. Here's our data from Amer American adults: 21% of men, 35% of women score as conflicted on the bus. Now they include the vegetarians, of course, and they include the the partial vegetarians. But most of these people are are eating meat but feeling bad about it. And they may be the mark of the future or not. We don't know if this number is growing or is stable or, or what. Next slide. So why people, what would, what would make people vegetarians? Well, some people don't like the taste of meat. They've never liked it, very few. Some people have health concerns and our culture has made a big deal about this. Um, that is, you know, eating a low saturated fat diet. Uh, I happen to personally think, I'm not a professional in this, that it's been exaggerated, but um, there are people who stay away from meat for purely health reasons. Then there are moral concerns, and there are three kinds. One is your religion forbids eating meat, uh, and that's some aspects of, depending on your particular version of Hinduism and Buddhism, that would be very possible. Then there's compassionate reasons. You, that's an old reason. That was the reason that people were vegetarians in ancient Greece, that it's, it's partly emotional. You don't like the thought of killing animals for human consumption. And then there's the environmental reasons, which are a new reason, and that has to do with, um, it's a more abstract idea that when you eat meat, you are, the environment is pay, taking a price because it's more expensive to generate calories and protein from meat than, say, from soybean. 
um, because you have to, the animal can eat the vegetables and, uh, and the corn and then converts it. Now, that's a complicated story. Most research in the field is on moral vegetarians because it's an interesting case where we really love meat, but there's many people, not all, obviously, 24% of you have some feeling it's not right. Now, some of you are, who are, think there's something bad about meat and think it's because it's unhealthy, and that's a different kind of conflict than in the sense that it's immoral. Moral vegetarians are more likely to find meat disgusting. So if you look at moral versus health vegetarians, many people are both. But if you look at people who are one or the other, it's the moral vegetarians who don't want to eat the meat, and they're put off by it. Most health vegetarians would say, I'd love to eat meat, but I can't. If they say tomorrow that meat is the best thing you can eat to, to not get COVID and uh, uh, you know maybe uh, live longer for some reason, then they would just be delighted to eat meat. So there's a bunch of researchers working on this. Now, it's not a big topic. I've just mentioned their names down there. Okay, let's, let's go on. So let's go back to this. This is a continuum. Most people gradually move from being an omnivore to a vegan, and many people move backwards. Many vegans give up and become vegetarians. It's hard to be vegan. And there are form, people who gave up being vegetarian. The general flow is to the right, down to the right, but there is definitely backward movement, and no one has really studied how that happens. I had a vegan who was working with me who just gave in because he, he loved cheese too much. And he said, I can't do it. I remember it happened while he was working with me. Here is a sense, this is, this is a very interesting plot. This is a, a German plot of the number of animals a, a typical German eats in their whole life, in their whole life. So four cows, about four sheep, a bunch of, uh, of uh, gooses. I can't read what it says there. And then uh, all those things at the bottom are chickens. There are pigs in the middle there. You can see them. Turkeys, quite a few turkeys. And look at all those chickens. So when you think about your relationship to meat, you think about what you've been doing for your whole life, and that's what you've been doing. Now, of course, people who are pro-vegetarian like to show this to people and say, look at all the animals you've killed. But you could say you have various responses to that, in including that we made those animals, so we have a right to kill them. That is, they're domesticated animals. Okay, next slide. I have now a slide. So one way people get to, to um, become vegetarians, once in a while, is a striking event, which makes them change their mind about eating meat. Here's an example of something like that from a Brazilian supermarket. Can we look at that now? Uh, yeah, let's play this. Okay, okay I, paused, I paused it there. Uh, that's good. Um, all right, so uh, the people who study meat eating have uh, de developed what's called the carnism scale, which is the justifications people for use for eating meat. It's natural, so the, the, there is there's a scale here. This is one question. It is only natural to eat meat, necessary. Human beings need to eat meat. Normal, it is normal to eat meat. Nice, meat is delicious. That's a pretty good set of reasons, and it's probably in the head of most meat eaters if you ask them, they haven't thought about it. Okay, next. Now, so how do you deal with this idea that eating animals is upsetting to people. They don't like to, most people don't like to watch the killing of animals. By the way, people who live in rural settings, I've lived in one for a little while in research, are used to watching the killing of animals and they don't, they're not upset by it. And they're not upset by eating a piece of an animal they just killed. But for people living in urban centers, well, in, in the markets in China and even in Europe, you'll see killing of animals, but we don't see that. So people uh, uh, support the four ends, nice, necessary, normal, and what, whatever the fourth one was for that, nutritious. Um, so you can deny the moral imperative. And one way you deal with that is you don't put it, you don't want it in your face. So you don't want to see that uh, meat grinding machine in the, Turk, in, the, um, in the Brazilian market. You don't go to slaughterhouses. You don't like it to see a side of animal. And America deals with that by not letting you see a side of pork. You don't see the animal from which that pork chop came. And another thing that people do is they dementalize eating animals. It's been shown 
that people who eat meat, which is most people, of course, um, to think, don't think very highly of the animals they eat. They don't think pigs or uh, cows are very smart. They don't think they have rich inner lives and so on. They would think a dog, which they mostly don't eat, is a different level of being. Okay, next slide. Now, interestingly, in English, we disguise to some degree the fact that uh, meat comes from animals. So we don't say we eat cow. They do say that in Spanish. We say we have a word for cow, beef. We have a word for calf, veal. We have a word for pig, pork. But we do say lamb, chicken, and fish. So we haven't done this completely, but we have those special words to separate some of our major meats from the, na from the animal from which they come. I remember my son when he was about five or so was sitting eating a piece of chicken and he suddenly said, that's a chicken. I mean, he, even though the name was there, he hadn't made the connection. Okay, next slide. So um, now we'll answer the question of the audience in a moment about who, what am I like. So the interesting thing is if you're, if you're trying to avoid meat, gradually maybe stopping at just being a, a, a reducitarian or a partial vegetarian, you have constantly, you're constantly under conflict, right? You have to say, can I eat this? You go to a restaurant and uh, a meat is served that you don't think you should eat, but everyone else is eating it. Or you go to someone's house and they serve it. So you, there's a lot of conflicts. And there's an unscripted moral course. How do you become a vegetarian if you want to? And the contrast is with the Jewish kosher system, which has rules about what you can eat. Of course, extensive rules, one of which is that you shouldn't eat pork, right? But the issue is that the, the, the kosher system tells you exactly what to do. You don't have to think about, can I eat this or not? Because they've worried about everything. So there's a, you know, the problem is you can't eat pork. What about if some pork fell into something or it has 1% pork or something? You know, suppose it has five molecules of, of pork. What do you do? The world is full of pork molecules from pig in the air. Someone's barbecuing pork chops next door. And the Jews have worried about that and they have rules. So they have, they have what's called the 160th rule, which is that if something not kosher falls into a kosher food and it by accident, and it constitutes less than 160th of the volume of the food, the food remains kosher. So you see, you don't have to worry about, can I eat this? Because there's a rule. And by the way, they've taken it one step further because suppose 180th of a, a little piece of pork falls into your kosher beef stew, that's still kosher. Now suppose another piece that's 180th falls in, separate piece. Now together, they make up more than 160th. So you've got the same problem. And they have a simple rule. It's only the biggest contaminant. If a 180th falls in, a 1 100th doesn't matter. So they've started to make it possible to live in a world where contamination is always the case. And, uh, and uh, they script everything, separate dishes, all sorts of things. Okay, but in, 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 in uh, becoming a vegetarian, you don't have that. So here's my story. I'm what you'd call a reducitarian or a partial vegetarian for about three years. I eat almost no mammals or birds. I said almost. I was originally eating no mammals. And then one of my vegan friends said, you know, the, it, one, yeah, the amount of meat in a cow is equivalent to 150 chickens. He said, they said to me, do you think the life of 150 chickens is worth less than the life of a cow? And I had to say, no. So I ended up not eating birds. But then I stopped and I've stopped there. I'm, for three years, I, I eat other things. So what you do is you make pre-commitments. You make rules so every time you face food, you don't have to run through this, do I have to eat it? So just to give you a sense, here are my personal rules. I have no contamination concern. I don't worry when I go to a Chinese restaurant. If the stir fry bowl that I ordered my stir fry shrimp in was previously used to, to make beef, that doesn't bother me. I have exceptions. When I go to a very special restaurant and they have a very special dish, that's beef, that's meat, or that's uh, fowl or, or mammal, I eat it. And if I'm fed as a guest, I eat it. 
If I go to someone's house and they serve beef, I'll eat it. Obviously, I don't find, unlike some of these moral, many moral vegetarians, I don't find beef meat disgusting at all. I love it. And I, don't put, I won't participate in the killing of animals, but I will eat meat if I don't feel I'm killing an animal. So I'll eat roadkill, though I've never had the chance to do that. I will eat leftovers. If someone I'm with orders a hamburger and doesn't finish it, it's going in the garbage. I'll eat it because I don't have to, I'm not adding to the killing of meat. And I'll eat accessory parts. It's a, I'll eat part of an animal which is the animal isn't killed for. So I'll eat beef tongue, which I happen to like, for example, because no one kills the cow for the tongue. So I, I'm not bragging about this. This is just one person's attempt to live with a moral concern about killing animals, but also to love meat. Next slide. I want to just briefly discuss the issue of is meat a male symbol? And I don't think I have much time left, do I? Uh, no. Uh, it's seven minutes. Okay, so let me quickly go through. I'm going to go really quickly here. I, don't, I should have asked as an open question. How many of you think meat is sort of something male about meat? But most of you would say yes to that. So I wanted to. I wanted with my colleagues to figure how could we show that meat was a male symbol. So let me just quickly run through this. Next slide. Men are hunters. Men are butchers. Meat is the preferred food. Men have power in traditional culture, and men get more meat or the best parts of meat. Men do almost all the gathering of meat, and that's what this table shows I will not spend time on. Next slide. Okay, so in traditional roles, it's clear that there's a relation between males and meat. Next. I actually wanted to ask, uh, do a quick poll. Yeah. Um, this is a very different style of webinar we're doing today. It's more academic style content from uh, from Paul, which I think is awesome myself. And I, we did want to get a, a read on whether you'd like to see more of this in this webinar setting, or if you'd like to see this type of content in a different type of setting, uh, or if it's just something you may not be that interested in. And no, we will not be offended if you choose that last, last option either. So we want to have more of this in this webinar, more of this, but maybe in a different forum or uh, nah, this is just not so much for you. So we'll give it another 10, 15 seconds. I know, Paul, we're trying to figure out where the best place, because there's so much more of this that you have to offer beyond just the psychology of meat, where it should fit. And uh, I'm gonna end polling now, because we have uh, several hundred responses already. And uh, here's where we are. So about two thirds of us said, great, let's do it in this webinar. About a quarter said, let's find a different way to do this. And a handful said, uh, not so much for me. So. We'll probably continue to do this if that's okay with you, uh, Paul, in this webinar format sure. in the future, but we will figure that out. And no, I look forward to discussing it with you, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. We'll figure that out. So, I mean, Paul had actually put together an entire um, syllabus, um, so to speak, of lots of different topics around the psychology of food. We thought the meat topic would be really interesting to kick off with and experiment with this to see if this would be a good forum to continue doing this in future episodes. But it looks like we'll probably go in that direction. But Paul, I'll figure out the details with you in, in okay. the meantime. Uh, okay, sorry. Back to our regularly scheduled program. So, do males prefer meat for more than females? Let me just tell you the answer is yes. Let's move on. I present some data, but I won't bother you with it. Next slide. And then males like meat more. Next slide. Are males less frequently vegetarians or red meat avoiders? The answer is yes. There are more vegetarian females, quite a bit more than males, cross-culturally. And also, women avoid red meat more than men do. Let's just go past the data. Let's go right past the data. OK, so now here's something that's a little different. There's something called the implicit associations test, which you may be interested in. It's an interesting way of getting people's, getting people's feelings and associations that they may not recognize. So let me just show you what it's like. Next slide. Uh, th these are very big effects. So it, it, the idea is, I'll give you an example right away. Uh, you're going to get 20 seconds to do as many as possible. Next slide. I'm not going to ask you to do this. If See these words here. You're exposed to them. You have, you're only exposed to them when you're doing it. You hit with your left, you tap with your left finger. If, if it's a flower or a good thing, the words, the words are flowers, good, bad, and 
uh, insects. If it's on, with your right finger, if it's the insect or a bad thing. So just going through this, daffodil would be left flower good, excellent left flower good, terrible right insect bad, right? Tulip, left flower good, cockroach, right insect bad, and so on. And, and, it, and you, get, you find out how many people can do, say, in 20 seconds, okay? And it turns out that flower good is, you get many more words categorized as flower or good, and insect is bad, than flower as bad, and insects is good. Because there's something that relates flower and goodness in your mind. So we did that with the meal, meat mail link. So we had three meat words, there they are, pork, beef, sausage, three vegetable words, pea, corn, lettuce, three male words, John David Harry, three female words, Jane Mary Diane. So here's the task. Next slide. So you go left if it's meat female for this one, right if it's vegetable male. So John is right, right? Uh, pork is left, right? Pea is right. Mary is left, beef is left, and so on. The next slide shows the opposite version, meat mail. So now it's P is right, Mary is right, John is left, pork is left, David is left, corn is right. Even just doing what I just did, you can see it's much easier to do this one. Yep. And in fact, it, it turns out that, next slide, um, most people get more words for meat mail uh, 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 vegetable female, then they have to categorize things as meat female, vegetable male. Next slide shows some data. So we had an odd study, 25 people on average, 20 to 25 words in 20 seconds, if it was meat male, meat male, and only uh, 19 if they did vegetable male. So that this is a measure that people aren't even aware of that somehow in their mind, meat goes with male and vegetable with female. Finally, next slide, we, so that, we, that supports the meat male link. And finally, we ask people just to rate how male things were. And on a scale, next slide. Uh, we just, they, we rated, they gave a bunch of foods and they had to rate them as zero, not at all, to 10 extremely. And they have to rate the maleness and femaleness of each food. And next slide shows the data for meats and you can see the red curve is, it's a zero to 10 scale. The red curve is what the males, the maleness rating, not by male. It's the male female rating of how male that food is. And the, the green is how female it is. And you see for all the meats, uh, male is rated, they're rated more male than female. It's not true for chicken and it's not true for fish. And just for the record, for chocolate, it goes the other way. Chocolate is more female than male. We actually see that in our data too, not the exact measure, but we ask preferences and what people like to eat in one of our services. And you see the exact same types of gender effects as well. Yeah, and chicken doesn't show it, yeah. So now we have red muscle, only red muscle meats. It's not true for liver, beef liver. Red muscle meats are rated as more male. And now quickly from Carol Adams points out something that I think is really important in our book, The Sexual Politics of Meat. She says, the sexual politics of meat proposes a specific conceptual term to recognize the exploitation of the reproductive process of female animals. Milk and eggs should be called feminized protein. That is protein that was produced by a female body. The majority of animals eaten are adult females and children. Female animals are doubly exploited, both when they're alive and when they are dead. Now, I thought this was way over the top. But I thought it was an interesting idea that milk and eggs are really female. So we put that, that was in this last survey. Next slide. We found that in fact, milk is rated about equally male and female. Egg is rated more male and female. And even beef placenta, which is not really good food, but you could eat it, some people, which is very female, is rated more male and female. So her idea about feminized protein is not represented in the, in the, in the minds of Americans in terms of eggs and milk being from females. Next slide. Okay, so let, here's some solutions to this problem of is, how do we deal with the morality of meat issue? We can ignore it, or we can argue against it. The four ends, natural, nice, normal, necessary. We created the domesticated animals, and we can improve rearing and killing practices to make them more humane. 
other, other ways to deal with it, we can make more efficient meat production, which would mean killing less animals and less pain. We, we, can, we can reduce our meat consumption. We can become vegetarians or part of vegetarians. We can eat meat substitutes, and that is a big thing. Impossible Burger and things of that sort, Beyond Meat, they are doing well, and they have the virtue that they taste sort of like meat. They don't taste quite like meat, but they're sort of like meat. And they're a little expensive now, but they will get cheaper. We can do cultured meat. That's very far along in the future, where you take cells from, uh, from animals and you culture them into full pieces of meat. And we have one other option, which is to eat insects, which are animals, technically. And I just want to very briefly mention that. This, go to, this is work done with the same Matthew Ruby and Chris Chan, who was an undergraduate major in anthropology and marketing. Insects have high quality protein. They have animal protein. They're safe to eat. They have an excellent plant animal calorie conversion. They, they are much more efficient, much better for the environment that way. They're easy to farm. They don't use much land, of course. And there's less of a cruelty dilemma because people don't seem to mind killing insects and you can kill them by cooling them. Greater than one billion people on Earth eat insects regularly. Little kids eat them. So there's a lot of things going for this, but they don't taste like meat, unlike the, the Impossible Burger. So they're not gonna produce that, satisfy that craving for that chewy, uh, meaty taste, unless you mix them with other things. Next slide. The reason people don't eat insects when they don't, like in the United States, is because they're disgusting. So the kids do it, and the, a billion people, most of the people who eat it, uh, Mexico and Southeast Asia are probably the two centers for eating insects, but there are other places. Go ahead. We've measured, you don't have to see the numbers, we've measured that disgust is what drives people to not eat insects. They're disgusted by them. They're just not, they're not one of the animals we eat. They don't like camels either. But one thing that we found that was a good predictor of whether people say they would accept insects is whether they eat sushi. Because sushi is a food that is potentially disgusting. It's raw fish, right? And so it's, you, you might think it might relate to insect eating, and it does. Next slide. So by this measure, that first thing we kicked off with, Paul, do you think that you'd see a higher uh, willingness among liberals and conservatives? Well, uh, uh, Jack pointed out that generally, Liberals seem to be more interested, uh, more open-minded, more interested in trying new things. So the answer would be yes, and you could find that we could find that out in your poll, Jack, on sushi very easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that it's people in their 20s and 30s who do most of the sushi eating. So people discuss there's a problem in many areas, not just in, uh, in insects, but we know that people get used to disgust. They get used to discussing things all the time. When you go to the theater, which we used to do, like we used to eat at restaurants, um, you're breathing the air of the person sitting next to you. That's pretty disgusting, but you get used to it. So how do we, we get used to all sorts of disgusting things. We get used to our own disgusts, our own body products. Um, here's some ways that we can get insects more acceptable. We could put them in, we can get, put them in pet food. So your pet eats them. It gets you used to them. We could, you can eat animals that are fed on insects. You do that now. Many fish are fed on insects, weird fish. You can make them cheap. Insects are now an expensive food because they, with all the mass production that makes beef and other meats cheap hasn't been done with insects. We can also make them taste better by breeding them. We have two ways of introducing insects. Flour, ground up. It it's a little nutty, but it tastes like wheat flour a little bit. A little nuttier, not bad. Or we could put them in whole, whole and savory foods, as some cuisines do. And we know that younger males, uh, 20s and 30s, are the most likely people to um, accept it. And uh, Jack suggests maybe Democrats. OK, next slide. So this just shows you we're just about finished. This is a, an example of, in New York, a, rest, a Mexican restaurant or last week. And they serve a number of insect foods. These are tacos with grasshoppers in them. Grasshoppers are quite tasty. They're crunchy. They don't have a strong taste. They're crunchy and sort of pleasant to eat. Very popular in Mexico. So I want to close with the idea that 
just as we started with putting something in your mouth is part of incorporating it into yourself. The next slide shows us this may be the future where the grasshopper is going into your mouth instead of the cucumber. So I thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Paul. Uh, I think they got, we got to find a way to get the legs off the insects, and that might be a little more. Well, you could do that. You could get pulled leg insects. I mean, you can get anything you want. People want it, they'll make it. That is an interesting job. Just pull those legs off all day long. Uh, everyone, uh, all the legs. Thank, someone's, someone's going to find a way to use the legs for something. Yeah, and, and, and thanks everyone for staying with us a little bit longer today. Just as a quick reminder, uh, we'll have some more COVID based content and maybe some election related material in a couple of weeks uh, at the same time, uh, Thursday, 12 p.m. Central. And if you want to contact us and, and aren't already working with us, just email us at hello at datacentral.com. Uh, Marie, uh, Paul, uh, seriously, thank you tremendously. Any questions at this time? Yeah, actually, we, we can do that. If anyone wants to stick around for an extra three or four minutes, um, Paul is able to answer any questions you might have just around food and psychology. Marie, I haven't been monitoring the chat. Is there anything that's come in that we could uh, ask Paul to field? We have a lot of thank yous right now. People enjoyed the content. Uh, Paul, as always, Let's see here. Um, I am not seeing anything specific. Paul, I have a question though. I've seen the rise in the carnivore diet and uh, in part because of the rise in autoimmune diseases in our country, that it's the solution for that. Have you heard about that at all? I've heard about the carnivore diet. I didn't know the link to the autoimmune disease. Uh, what is the link supposed to be? I guess that it's a possible treatment to help diseases like Hashimoto's or other autoimmune disorders. Well, you know, because, because they're relative, very rare to have an allergy to animals. Yeah. And that's for the same reason that they house up the pathogens. They're like us, so we're much less likely to develop an allergy to them. Though, once you can develop an allergy to yourself, you can certainly develop an allergy to cow. But yeah. they're, they're low allergy foods. And that's true of insects too, but though there is some allergy to insects, uh, you know, their insects are related to crustacea, to shell, to shellfish, to uh, lobsters and crabs. And there is, there are people who have allergies to lobster and crab, and they may have allergies to insects too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul, I have a question as well, and maybe we could um, wrap up with this one. We found in our in our work uh, pretty conclusively that the best way to get people to try a new taste or a new flavor, maybe a sauce or something from around the world or a spice, is to put it in a familiar application like a, a burger or a pizza or a taco. And that way the dish itself is not risky, right? You get to try something new, it's a little bit different, but the dish itself isn't risky. Would that principle apply to something like insects too? Do you try to put them in a familiar application? To oh yeah, much of the, if you wanna eat insects in the United States, the best way to find them is in insect breakfast bars, which have 10% insect flour, and they taste like regular breakfast bars because insects don't have a strong taste. My, uh, my departed wife in our cookbook, the Flavor Principle Cookbook, pointed out that each, most major cuisines have a flavor that they put on every food that they eat, every savory food. So in China, it would be soy sauce, ginger root, and perhaps rice wine. So if you want to make a food acceptable to Chinese, say potatoes, they don't eat much potatoes, you treat it like a Chinese food. You, you, you stir fry it and you put Chinese flavorings on it and Chinese will eat it because it's, it looks like my food. So that's the point you're making. And you can start with very low levels. So you could start with 1% insects or whatever it is that you're trying to get people. To you don't have to give them the whole thing right in their face. You can get them used to it. And if it's, if it's important to do that, uh, now, it isn't important to get people to eat insects in the United States because we have plenty of meat and we're pretty wealthy. It's in the developing world where they're short of protein mm. that they can get this as a potentially short of protein. Where this comes up more is in water because getting people to, uh, to accept recycled water is a problem. That's water that goes right from sewage to pure water in a plant. People don't want to drink that water, even though it's better than their regular water. And so one way to get them to do it is to give them 1% recycled in regular water or to mix it in the groundwater and to sort of get, get them used to it. We know, we know 
that after a few weeks of drinking it, they won't even think about it. Hmm. It's getting them over that initial hump. And that's, there are various tricks to do that. If you had to guess, do you think in the next 20 years, insects can become mainstream? I don't know because they're competing, among other things, with, uh, with uh, 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 substitute meats like Impossible Burgers, which are maybe ultimately more expensive, but they have the virtue that they taste like meat. Yep. So insects are more tasteable like potato chips. Than they, I mean, when they, if, they're, if they're fried up like that, like mm-hmm. they're wild chips. So I never make predictions about the food world. I'm so often surprised by what people eat and, and, and what people do. I mean, I love Indian food, and Indian food is not made it in the United States. And I, I don't know why. I can't explain it. I can't explain why Thai food is very popular, but Vietnamese food isn't. We have many more Vietnamese than we have Thai in this country. And Vietnamese food is delicious. I don't understand any of this. Uh, you know, and, that, the, and the food industry, of course, does it. most of their products fail. It's not that they're not, not smart. It's that it's extremely hard to predict what's going to catch on. That's sushi. what we do. So uh, I think we will. Yeah, <laughs> who would have predicted that sushi would be popular in the United States? There's a lot of really good Japanese food, yakitori, noodle dishes, that would be a natural for Americans. So what do we like most? Raw fish. Who would have figured it? Hmm. Can't predict it. Well, maybe you can. You can do a little better. No, no, and that's why you're in business. You can do a, you can do better than other people, even though you're not going to be certain. You can a little edge is worth a lot of money. Well, sushi you know? has a snob effect to it too, right? Yes, that, that is it's certainly still, it's still an upper class, food, upper yeah. middle class food. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's expensive. Um, with that, we are at time. Uh, Paul, thank you again. Marie, thank you again. Everyone, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we got some great stuff coming up in two weeks, and we will see you then. And just as a reminder, uh, this will be posted on YouTube, and you can find our previous webinars on YouTube as well. Uh, and if you need the slides from any of the previous webinars, they are attached to those YouTube videos for now. Just click on the More button where the description is, and you'll see a link to download the slides. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have up a resources page on the Data Central site that will have a, an easier way to download all the previous webinars and slides and everything else you need. Uh, but you can also go there now and get all the different reports that we offer completely for free. And uh, we say thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Thank Rosen. you, Paul. Bye, thank Paul. you, Jack. Bye, Marie. Bye everyone. Bye.